for a number of years now, there has been a growing concern that the assessment practices used in schools are failing to accurately measure student success. I'm Dr. Betty Wiggins and tonight I will be speaking with Kate Dykstra, a Master's of Education candidate at the University of Ontario Institute of Technology. Kate will be discussing the topic of authentic assessment with us and she will also share some of the unique benefits this practice holds in the field of special education. Kate, welcome to Education Today and thank you for coming to speak to us about authentic assessment. Thank you for having me Dr. Wiggins. I am quite excited to share my learning with you and to be able to discuss the benefits of authentic assessment with your audience. So, Kate, what exactly is meant by authentic assessment? Well, Dr. Wiggins, there are a few definitions of the term that can be found in the literature. I like the one provided by your Uncle Grant. He states that assessment is authentic when we directly examine student performance on worthy intellectual tasks. A worthy intellectual task? You had better explain that a bit further. Shouldn't all activities that students do at school be considered worthy intellectual tasks? They absolutely should be. But unfortunately, they are not. Unless tasks are realistic and practical for learners, they cannot be considered authentic. When a student is being assessed, information needs to come from a variety of sources, such as portfolios, work samples, reflection, performances open-ended questions, hands-on tasks, and, very important, teacher observations. That's quite a list of sources to assess, Kate. I couldn't help but notice that you did not mention exams though. Why is that? Don't you think that exams are important? Examinations were first introduced as a means by which educators could quickly give the same questions to each of their students at the same time. The problem with exams is that they tend to be nothing more than a snapshot of a student's ability, a snapshot which is taken completely out of context. Consider a student who has been studying for five months in an Ontario secondary school. For five months, that student has been attending class regularly, participating in discussions, completing in-class activities with a high degree of competence sharing ideas with others and generally demonstrating a high level of understanding of course materials. And then time stops. A student is given a defined period of time, usually just two to three hours, to recall and regurgitate information learned over the course of an entire semester. Information that is taken out of context and holds little meaning in the student's life. Information that will account for one-third of a final grade. Does this type of practice really tell us what our students are capable of? Is it really telling us what we want to know? And if we are testing only to see whether or not our students have been able to store and recall declarative knowledge, what then are we really teaching? We need to look at our teaching practices to see if we are truly aiming to meet the goal of education, and that is, to raise children to be contributing members of society. I had never really thought of it that way Kate but it really does not seem to make sense. Why is our educational system set up this way? The industrial age model of education was designed with a one-size-fits-all approach. The system didn't take into account that children are individuals and learn in different ways. Some children were able to stay on track and achieve success in such a system. But there were others who always seemed to be left behind trying desperately hard to keep up in a system that simply did not meet their needs. There is actually a fabulous video on YouTube, which was created based on a talk given by Sir Ken Robinson. Robinson compares our educational system to a production line, with students working their way through the system in batches. The problem with this system is that tasks are broken down into small pieces which hold little to no meaning for students learning becomes irrelevant and higher-order thinking skills cannot be developed. But if the system is working for some, why change it for everybody? According to John Biggs, it is only the highly academic students who will take what they learn at school and turn it into functioning knowledge. Most will not. Using authentic activities in the classroom will benefit all students. Think of somebody planning a trip across the Atlantic Ocean. You could give that person a boat and they could sail across. It would take a long time and the journey would be quite difficult. 
or you could teach that person to fly a plane, and therefore be much more efficient at meeting the intended outcomes of the task. Teaching should be about giving students the right tools they need to succeed in life. We need to prepare students to be successful for whatever life brings them. Teaching should be about guiding students as they develop the skills they need to live in the 21st century. We cannot just expect them to remember sets of arbitrary facts. Are you suggesting that educators stop teaching content altogether? No, certainly not. There is core academic knowledge that students do need to learn. But that knowledge needs to have a practical application in our students' lives. And helping students to develop 21st century skills will give them a greater opportunity for success. Kate, I've been hearing more and more about 21st century skills. What are they? I actually hadn't heard of this term until quite recently and so did some additional research to understand what is meant by 21st century skills. According to the Partnership for 21st Century Skills, students need to master core subjects on 21st century themes. Students need skills in language, maths and arts. They need global awareness and an understanding of economic, civic, environmental and health literacy. They need to develop their skills in the areas of critical thinking, communication, collaboration and creativity. Students need to know what to do with all the information to which they have access and they must be literate with a variety of media and information and communication technologies. Finally, students need to be flexible, adaptable, and self-directed. They need initiative and an ability to work well with others. They must be accountable responsible and demonstrate leadership qualities. Those are fabulous skills, Kate. Tell us why they are important. It used to be the case that the majority of students would end up spending their adult lives working in a single profession. Schools would stream students to teach them the specific knowledge and skills that they would require for their expected jobs. However, today's students will likely change their careers multiple times throughout their adult lives. Many will hold jobs that don't even exist today. We need to prepare students to be successful with whatever life brings them. So, how do schools teach these skills? What is the research saying? This is where the whole concept of authentic tasks and activities comes into play. Kate, would you please give us an example of an authentic task? Certainly. I recently designed a performance-based learning activity that provides a good example of an authentic task. Wait a minute. Performance-based learning activity. What do you mean by that exactly? Lynn, Baker and Dunbar state that a performance-based learning activity is one that emphasizes problem-solving, critical thinking, comprehension, reasoning and metacognitive processes. The activities should mimic those of real-life tasks and place an emphasis on the process, not just the product. Let me share my example with you in order to clarify what I mean. A few months ago, I needed to plan a new science and technology unit. I started my planning with the outcomes which I hope to accomplish with my students. I wanted my students to obtain information about germs that could affect them and make them ill. But I didn't want them to simply gather information and be done with it. I wanted them to demonstrate that they knew what germs were, how they are spread, and how their spread can be minimized. I also wanted them to identify ways in which individuals can maintain a healthy environment for themselves and for other living things. My students were to collaborate with their group members to present information to the rest of the class. And finally, my students were to apply their technological skills as they researched, organized and presented information pertaining to germs. I set up the activity by telling my students that we were concerned about the number of absences due to illness. I gave my students a very brief overview of germs but did not go into much detail as I wanted them to find relevant information on their own. I asked my students to work in groups to find out about germs, what they are, how they are spread, and what we can do to reduce the number of students away from school due to illness. I then observed as the students gathered information, guiding them as necessary but letting them do all their own research. I let the children decide the ways in which they were going to share their information. Some chose to create videos, others made posters to hang in the halls. And one group even created an electronic brochure to a go home with the class newsletter. The project was ill-defined, meaning that the students chose their own direction. 
It was relevant to their lives as it presented them with a real-life situation. It allowed them to collaborate and use their critical thinking and technological skills. Throughout the process, I allowed the students time for self and peer reflection. I looked through their notes as they worked and observed the process. At the end of it all, I assessed the final presentations and products and also held group meetings for further feedback. That sounds fabulous Kate, and I understand now what you mean about authentic tasks. What a wonderful opportunity for learning, and now, we have only a few minutes left and I really would like to hear about the ways in which authentic assessment is beneficial for students with special learning needs. Absolutely Dr. Wiggins. As I already mentioned, traditionally, our educational system has not been appropriate for the vast majority of our students. I am a strong advocate for inclusion, as long as that placement meets the individual needs of the student. Authentic task and assessment practices allow greater opportunities for all students to demonstrate their learning and mastery within a general classroom setting, and especially benefits students with special learning needs in the areas of equity and motivation. According to the Ontario Ministry of Education, there needs to be a variety of means in place in a classroom in order for diverse sets of learners to reach their goals. Darling Hammond states that observation of performance allows for the growth of all students to be acknowledged, regardless of their levels of competence. Wiggins also points out that authentic assessment practices are responsive to individual students and lets them clarify their responses. It is so important that students with special learning needs are afforded the opportunity to justify their responses as this gives understanding into the student's interpretation of the question itself as well as the actual meaning behind the responses provided. Let me share an example. The class was shown three shapes and asked which one had the greater area. One particular student looked over the shapes and then announced that the green shape had the greater area. The teacher had expected him to select the red shape, so she asked him why he had chosen the green one. He responded that the red one had the greatest area, and ranking them great, greater, greatest, that left the green one to have the greater area. I see. That certainly does provide a case for evaluation being most equitable when open dialogue between teacher and student is encouraged, doesn't it? Absolutely. In my example. The teacher was looking for a particular answer but dialogue shed light on the student's thought processes. Wiggins also tells us that authentic assessments, eliminate testing for one correct answer and provide opportunities for the determination of a student's areas of aptitude. This is vital in special education when students' strengths must be identified in order to use them to compensate for identified weaknesses. Authentic assessment also reduces comparisons between students. Cohen warns us that some evaluation procedures are used to sort students into categories of ability. This practice is one which is detrimental to supporting students as they learn. It is a practice which is counterproductive to the provision of inclusive learning environments. Students develop at different rates and Eisner tells us that authentic assessment provides teachers with opportunities to reveal the distinctive features of individual students. These distinctions celebrate and promote differences between learners. Some students with special learning needs appear to lack motivation and fail to achieve to their levels of potential. However, students demonstrate more of an interest in their tasks and perform to higher standards when the focus on grades is removed. When we stop emphasizing grades, interest levels and creativity rise, and fear of failure decreases. Students with special learning needs often face issues with self-confidence and self-esteem but authentic assessment practices help create confident and capable learners. They allow students opportunities to express their own aptitudes and interests as they demonstrate mastery in their learning. This allows them to recognize the value of their work. Kate, this has all been so very informative. Authentic activities and assessment practices really do seem to allow students individualized opportunities to demonstrate their learning and growth. They certainly do Dr. Wiggins. And it is through these practices that we truly are guiding students to reach their highest potential. Kate, thank you so much for being our guest this evening. We wish you the best of success as you continue your studies. Thank you Dr. Wiggins.